Okay, we are at our start time. So I'm gonna get started and do some introductions. So I'm Abby Quinlan, I am with Causebox. And this is Jessica. She will be doing her own bio in a minute, but I wanna give a brief intro. Jessica is a nonprofit strategist. She's a development and management consultant. So she supports the social sector organizations with strategic development and management. So let's jump into a little bit about Causevox, your host for today. So Causevox is a digital fundraising platform for nonprofits. We help you raise more with less time and effort. You can use Causevox to grow through donation forms, campaign pages, pledge donations, event ticketing and raffles, and peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. We offer a best-in-class fundraising platform that makes it simple and easy for you to run high-performing fundraising, especially with your initiatives. Also, when you work with Causevox, we come alongside you and provide an incredible amount of hands-on support so you can get started in no time. And lastly, our social mission is to educate and equip. Not only do you get amazing free fundraising education like this, but you also have a library of best support, great resources and templates, and you can keep on using those to leverage your product for digital fundraising. To modernize your donations, think about this. Nine out of 10 nonprofits suffer from that clunky donation form syndrome. These are the forms that look outdated and are hard to use for donors and extremely slow, pushing donors to stop. Causevox modernizes your donation form so you can convert more donors and increase the gift size automatically through one-time reoccurring and pledge donations. You're able to campaign for anything. Instead of being boxed into the donation form or dependent on your IT, you can use Causevox to launch a beautiful, completely branded to your nonprofit campaign that drives donations. It also includes social media sharing, donation counters, and donation reporting for all of that to be in one place for your nonprofit. You have hands-free peer-to-peer fundraising. That means you can reach new donors because that is one of the hardest parts about being a nonprofit development. So we're able to streamline that with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. So you can use any walk, race, run, and plug it into existing fundraising initiatives. Try this on your virtual events or gala, for example, and you'll see two times more donations. And you have the opportunity to sell tickets. You're able to sell more tickets for your events because let's be real, they're hard to manage and organize if you're not actually getting the results. Instead of using a ticket site and a donation form, you can make it easy with Causevox ticketing in all one place. Sell free and paid tickets, take donations and use it for raffle fundraising. Okay, so we have a great session ahead of us. I'm gonna let Jessica take it from here. Great, thank you. And as we get through, make sure you drop your questions in the chat and we will try to get to them at the end of today. All right. Turn. All right, can you all see my main screen or do I need to go in a slideshow mode? All right, here we go. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been in the field my whole social, uh, my whole professional career. I've been uh, really working on um, development in some form or another. Um, I'm doing grant writing. I've done annual campaigns and direct mail appeals, uh, digital engagement campaigns. Um, I highlight there was doing it with Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation. Um, and now I've really have expertise in all the big things a development shop does, um, partnership development, uh, financial management, major gifts. Um, and, you know, some of that work has been really deepened with, with some of the stuff that we're talking about here today. So I'm eager to share this with all of you. All right. 
So um, today, these are some of the, the structure for, the, for our time together. Um, we'll just go quickly over what a SWOT analysis is, why it's helpful, the limitations, because there are some, um, how we could do a SWOT together today during our, our time. So you have um, some immediate benefit to some of the, to spending your time here with us. Um, and then finally, how you're going to incorporate that information um, into an actual work plan, whether that is going to be something for your own own professional development plan, something that fits into your team's um, fundraising objectives for the year, um, or some, some work just to help you do um, your work better. All right, and we are going to do a quick poll here. Um, uh, I want to just check in with you all to find out how you feel about your goals right now. Are they both strategic and actionable? Um, and I took the, you know, the um, answers from a, a beautiful, cute little eight ball, uh, magic eight ball. So you could either feel, yes, definitely your at goals are strategic and actionable. Reply hazy, try again, or you're very doubtful. So I am seeing about 58% replying hazy, got 30% who are confident, yes, and many who are very doubtful. Oh, gosh. All right. Well, then hopefully this time will be of, of help to you. Um, thanks. Thanks so much, Abigail. Um, great. Um, then we have a good place to start. So um, I just need to close the poll. All right. So here we're, we'll start off with um, what actually is a SWOT analysis for those of you who might not know. Um, it is um, an analysis tool. It was developed in the 1960s. Uh, strategic planners use it usually in that first discovery stage of an engagement. So it's just a you know, really useful way for um, folks to get a baseline understanding of an organization and the communities that it's a part of. Um, and then you use aspects of the analysis questions um, to interview all types of stakeholders. So it's your peers, it's, um, it can be aspirational models, it can be people on your own team, folks just generally in the community. It can be a very broad um, swath of, of folks um, to you know, get their perspective on and then incorporate and synthesize into your understanding of the organization. So, um, you know, a SWOT example, this is like basically the basics of, of what it looks like. Um, it's, you know, strength, strength and weaknesses. And those are terms um, that they're focused on the internal environment. So those are about like the inherent characteristics um, of what you're focusing on. And the opportunities and threats are really things that are more external in nature. And one thing I do want to pause right here um, is around the language that we use for this. You know, as I mentioned, this tool was built in the 1960s. Um, you know, it was a whole different era in terms of you know, cultural awareness. And so many people find today that the terms, you know, weaknesses and threats aren't particularly helpful to um, gaining trust with folks that you're interviewing, um, you know, advancing a dialogue uh, and those um, and people who really value collaboration and like an abundance mindset might find those terms um, a little off-putting. So um, just be aware of that. Um, you know, some there are other alternatives to the SWAT that you can um, that are out there that might be able to help you a little bit more. Things that might fall a little bit more into the you know appreciative inquiry kind of house of of doing things. But so I just wanted to give you a heads up there. Um, so how is a SWAT helpful? Um, so it's best used when um, your team might be considering a new type of fundraising um, or it's considering you know, engaging a new community. Um, so you kind of know what the best, what could be like the best pointers for, for how to do that engagement well. Um, it's really great if uh, to uncover the assets that you might not even be aware of um, on for you or your team, um, as well as detecting unrealized um, vulnerabilities. So 
um, you know, when it's done well and broadly, um, it can really help an organization fight tunnel vision. Um, you know, a strength is that some people do a SWOT analysis very quickly um, and don't really engage other kind of perspectives, in which case they'll end up having data that just reinforces their point of view. Um, so, you know, when you do do it well, you know, it really shows the val the community that you're a part of what you um, value and that you've incorporated their um, considerations and um, values into what you're doing. And ultimately, your communications are more effective. All right. Um, yeah, so that really brings us to like the biggest win of a SWOT when I've been doing them as an organization. Um, folks that are a little bit reticent about um, trying something new, whether that's on your team or in your organization or maybe even donors that you need to win over, when they feel that they've been heard um, and that that thinking has been reflected in um, and acknowledged and what your next steps are, you know, folks feel more validated and they're more, more likely to. Um, you know, invest energy in your um, shared goals and strategies. Um, all right, and I do wanna just um, open up to one question that came in. It says, how do you work with people outside of your organization who want to fundraise for you through personal connections, but don't want to include you in the conversation or oof, provide, you, uh, provide you their contact? Gosh, that's... Um, that's a really good question. So um, I think it's really great, you know, before you say yes, is to like dig a little bit deeper on why um, that person is reticent um, to include you into the, in the, in the conversation. They might be trying to protect you from something that's a little bit sensitive, but um, you know, I, I think it's really important to have that conversation. And, you know, hopefully there are some questions that we'll go over here in the SWOT that might serve you in having that conversation. All right. So um, I just wanted to share with you, you know, things people will surprise you uh, when you do uh, do a SWOT analysis and you uh, engage in this conversation. I did one recently at year end um, with a with a client's um, one of their one of their major gift donors and. They were just so engaged with the conversation that the organization got another gift, which was unexpected from from that donor. So, um, you know, it was time really well spent, especially for the organization, since I was the one doing the interview. But um, anyway, people will surprise you and uh, in a really positive way when you have a meaningful conversation with them about how they feel about your organization and where you're going. All right. So that being said, there are some great things that can happen for your organization, but it's also hopefully very helpful to you. Um, what this can translate into for your team, right, is ideally that you have more focused priorities. And I, an important kind of aspect of this is thinking about that those priorities are more meaningful for you and your team. And I think that's a, a, that's a big one because we want you all in your jobs to be like, excited about what you're doing to know that it's like not just important in a broad way for the cause that you care about, but actually important for you um, in your work life. Um, another great aspect to this is that when you start engaging people in a meaningful dialogue, you will learn things about what your organization is doing that you just cannot capture in a survey um, or in a grant report. Um, so you'll learn about program wins and hopefully have some new stories to share. Um, and then finally, for you, just as a professional, you'll have a greater understanding of your organization, aware of its, you know, challenges and the things that it has to navigate. Um, and hopefully that allows you to make more valuable contributions when you're in group settings um, and when you're coming up with and, and executing on your plans. All right. That being said, there are some limitations to a SWAT. And... One thing to note, or a few things to note, is that first it's used as a um, starting point um, for, for doing a deeper analysis and that it really just reflects people's perspective in a certain point in time. Um, 
it's another big critique of it is that it, it identifies challenges and of course strengths and wonderful good things about you, but it won't always, um, those folks won't always give you ways to solve the things that they're concerned about. And so it requires more thinking after the, after you completed the SWAT. And then finally, um, that, you know, your insights are affected by your knowledge, your, your sources, knowledge and biases. So, you know, if you're trying to be an organization that's trying to reach new communities, but those folks and those voices aren't a part of the SWOT analysis, then obviously it's going to be a little bit lacking. Um, and, you know, just being aware that like, we're all on our own journey of becoming better humans and not everyone's going to be able to, you know, be at a certain level of dialogue that you might be hoping for. Um, so just know that you might have to supplement data points, you know, from other folks and other resources. Okay, so during our SWAT today, I just wanted to like frame out what we could do together. So I think it's really great to start with you. Um, what are your perspectives um, about your team and program? Um, we're gonna create like a little chart um, of, of the SWAT, that two by two diagram that you saw. And after your chart's been completed, you know, we can kind of reflect on how you personally are, are kind of like relating to that data that you just wrote down. All right, guidance on answering some questions. Some folks, when they answer this, have very broad observations about how they're feeling um, about their program or about um, their work. And other people are going to have um, very specific examples of like how um, they relate to the question. So um, I find when you are specific is good. And when you do it, I love using an SBI framework to do, um, to answer the question. So framing out the situation, then identifying the behavior that, that came about in that situation, and then what the impact of that behavior is. Um, it's a nice neutral way of presenting how you feel about something. And also, um, if you are actually going to share this with folks at some point, you want to be able to create it in a neutral way so people can, you know, access it in the way that you, you know, intend for them to do it. Okay. Also, it's totally okay to not know every answer to every question. Um, you know, if you're doing this full out and you start looking about at organizational health, you know, if you're someone in development or communications, you probably, you know, aren't going to know all the nuances of your the different programs um, that your organization runs, or you know the you know the in depth concerns of maybe folks in the finance team. So that's okay. Um, if you can look to direct and inferred data, um, you know, ca the Cosbox um, platform has really great um, analytics on how you're performing as an organization with your solicitations and your peer to peer fundraisers. So if you can try and find themes in some of that work, you know, if there's certain kinds of fundraisers um, or ideas that seem to be resonating with your community, it's great to take note of that. And you can put that into the strengths part of your SWOT analysis. Okay, so moving into our first square, your SWOT, um, your strengths, right? Um, so three big questions here are, um, what accomplishments have uh, you shared with your community? What positive feedback uh, have you received? Um, and so that can be both what you see in emails as well as just conversations that you've had with folks um, about your work. And then finally, um, have you found yourself in, has your organization that is, has, have they found themselves in new community collaborations? And then are you actually closer to some people in your community than maybe you've been in the past? You know, how has, how have relationships changed? Um, and specifically, if you can think about, was there something that that you leveraged as an organization, your expertise um, or your action in a certain campaign that helped make that happen. All right, weaknesses um, or vulnerabilities. You know, this is an important thing to be aware of too. Um, and it can be a little uncomfortable, but it's an important thing, um, you know, to help us grow uh, to answer these questions. Um, 
Number one, what made it hard for you to meet your mission and goals in um, over the past year? Um, what hard conversations did you have with stakeholders? Um, and was there a shared theme to those issues? And then finally, um, oh, I think one, this is one we can all feel um, right now is how and when were you over capacity um, with your work? All right, opportunities, this is a fun one. Um, do you have new knowledge and assets um, that you've acquired over the past year? Um, what new communities did you join or where um, do you now play a bigger role? Uh, who has asked you for advice? Um, I find this one to be a good one because it's usually one that you don't always in, think about, um, but then when you reflect on it um, about who you've had, new and interesting conversations with, there might be, you know, a theme there. Um, and then finally, um, who, um, what are you excited to tackle this year? Yes, um, and so I just wanna share with folks um, that you will receive a copy of this presentation afterwards. Um, we're, I'm so glad that you guys can be here today and I'm happy to be of service to you with that. Um, so I hope, it, I hope it serves you. All right, moving on, threats. Okay, so what's keeping you and your team up at night? Uh, what concerns are you hearing? Uh, and then what projects and relationships just aren't moving forward? And I think there's a, a re really good one. Are there peer organizations to you? And that could be in your own community or um, peer organizations that are in another geography that you know people ask you about or that you just are aware of. Um, are they doing things that you just can't do right now? All right, um, so next up, if you think about you at the closest part, um, you know, you might wanna interview your team um, and the folks that, that help you do your work well, whether that be um, your own staff or maybe there are some close volunteers that are engaged with you in fundraising um, and, and they're a wonderful people to, you know, to engage on the, in this conversation. So um, I will want to, I do want to say that it's best to do this in a conversation format. Um, some folks might be tempted to try and put this into a survey um, and you can, uh, it's just that it really doesn't give you the same quality information that a conversation does. Um, interviewing really helps uh, you build trust. It helps you kind of capture the nuance of what people are saying. Um, and it helps you ask, it helps you know when to ask for clarifications um, with something that they've shared with you. Um, when you're doing this, um, I, it is important to impart to folks that um, you know what they're sharing with you isn't something that you're going to pass on um, in a, a personally identifiable way. People are more apt to share meaningful um, information with you when they know um, that they're not going to be, you know, directly attributed for, for what they're sharing. Um, more likely to be a little bit, um, you know, they more likely to share maybe some things that they might feel are sensitive. Okay. Um, oh, I just wanted to add when you're collecting numerous, um, you know, feedback sessions, right? Um, I like to put them all on one Excel spreadsheet um, to help you recognize the similarities and some of the answers. So, you know, putting questions into rows and then the people that you're interviewing into the columns um, really helps me kind of organize my thinking for, for you know, later on. Um, and all right. Um, Oh, here, I've wanted to ask, here's a, a question. Um, have you heard of an organization using um, strengths and weaknesses for internal and OT for external um, when using a SWAT for a department? I'm at an org that does it um, in this way and it's super confusing for a newbie. <laughs> yeah, um, gosh. Um, I do find that confusing, actually. Um, I can understand that. I haven't heard of an organization doing it that way because um, we want folks to incorporate 
the whole the external environment through the lens of that department, I guess. And so when you, I, yeah, I would rather see it as like an organization on an organizational level. Um, it, it you'll be prone to like people being siloed, I guess, if if you do that, um, if you split the SWAT, and that makes any sense. So. All right. Um, all right. So when, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to slide ahead there. Um, all right. So other folks to include, um, of course, volunteers, frontline staff, other people that are um, finance and administrative staff, program participants, um, aspirational models. Those are all, all folks that you could look to. Um, I do think it's really great, especially with people who, um, connect to your organization as, you know, frontline staff, people who might have to use and account for their time in different ways than you do um, as a development or communications person, um, that it might be really hard for them to participate even if they want to. So trying to find a way to make that easy for them to do it, offering um, thank you gifts uh, is, is, really, is really great um, because we know that there is a, is a cost for some people to take time out to, to help you. All right, man. next part. Um, another just important thing to think about is what your own mindset is. You know, how you listen to folks really impacts how you capture the data and what data you capture. Um, so I thought it'd be nice to kind of think of like three avatars for um, qualities that I really like to have in mind when I'm, I'm talking to folks. Um, you know, expansive thinking, um, trying to draw connections between what people are saying, especially when they're bringing up something that has to do with the external environment, um, both opportunities and threats. Um, being non-judgmental, um, so really trying to be present with someone and um, not trying to read in to what they're saying uh, and asking for clarifications whenever you can. Um, and then finally being attentive. Uh, so really showing that um, and maybe explaining to folks, you know, ahead of time that you need to write down what they're saying so you capture it accurately. Or if you want to record it, you can do that too. Um, so just those are really, you know, three great things. Um, and I think another important thing to keep on um, mind of right now um, is that when you're interviewing folks, you should be aware of your own identity and the proximity of your identity to that of somebody else's. And so, um, you know, I'm a mid-career white lady, and I don't know if a, a young person um, who, if they're um, black or belong to like an immigrant community, they might have a hard time explaining and sharing things with me. And so to be sensitive to that is important. Um, if this isn't something that you really want to do and that you can do um, and that your team supports you on, thinking out other folks that you can buddy up with um, to collect these data, this data and do this, um, have this conversation in a way that is going to be sensitive and respectful to the people that you're trying to engage is really gonna help you just improve what you're taking in. If that makes any sense. Okay, great. All right. Um, so the, yeah, that kind of brings us into um, the guidance on how we do the synthesis from our SWATs. Um, so you wanna be aware that you know, sometimes it's hard for people to share things, especially if your organization might be going through a big change right now, um, whether that's a leadership change, um, staffing shortages, these are all things that can like impact how people feel in their job at the moment. Um, and if there's some bigger issues around um, how certain teams are relating to each other, um, or if there's a need for, or, or just like I say, if there's a lack of um, a strong feedback loops and communications between um, teams on an organization that can impact the kind of conversations that you might have. Um, and then finally, if, if folks don't have a strong practice of thinking about their program's impacts in, in ways, um, if you don't have strong analysis functions, this can even go for your own development team. Um, if you're not doing the analysis on your performance, it's going to be a little bit, it's going to be harder for you to really suss out what is um, 
a true vulnerability and what a true threat might be. Um, and then really being clear on, on what the big wins are. So say word of caution. Um, okay, so how we're going to incorporate a SWOT into a work plan. Um, so you, number one, just want to synthesize that information um, so that all the major themes are represented into observations. And then you compare these observations to how you ideally want to incorporate them into something. So if you have, um, you know, the, your annual work plan goal for your own performance this year, um, hopefully you have a broader one for your team and your fundraising goals, um, or if it even connects into perhaps a strategic plan that your organization just did, and you have, you know, some big, big ideas for 2022 that need to be incorporated, hopefully um, what you learn from this process will fit into one of those three things. Um, and then when you move into synthesizing and you want to create goals, um, you know, having that smart um, mindset and that smart approach um, is one that's really helpful for many organizations. Um, for those of you who might need a recap on what a SMART goal is, it's just like how we construct a goal so that it's really meaningful for you um, to structure your work and then share that work afterwards, right? So here's the acronym right here, right? It's specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and time-bound. Um, I found that Causebox has some really cool tools on um, the fundraising year and, and um, calendar, which is really great for breaking down um, your broader goals for the year and then specific goals you might have for your um, individual campaigns and fundraisers. All right. Um, you're going to see a lot of information, maybe depending on how big your um, your data set is, and and so trying to figure out what the priorities are can be challenging. So, um, especially if you're trying to take something that it's going to incorporate into your own professional development work plan. So um, I heard these questions to you um, to help you with that. Uh, one is how do your talents and role uh, further strengthen or diversify that of your teams? So hopefully you're making a strength even stronger or you are counteracting um, a weakness that your team has had. Um, that could be great. Um, there are um, what areas of improvement um, are best to address and in integrate into our work plan because, you know, frankly, we all have weaknesses, but not all of those weaknesses or vulnerabilities are things that like have to be addressed. We all have way more choices and opportunities in front of us than we have time to pursue. So figuring out what are the things that are going to be best for you and, and your career and the success of your team and, um, and your org as those are the ones you need to focus on. Um, we think about opportunities, thinking about how we define a, a, a really great opportunity are going to be ones that are really value aligned with um, your you know, funding and communication. So, you know, you want to go to those ones, um, those ideas that are closest to you or easiest to actually incorporate and pursue. And then um, finally, what challenges would make your organization less relevant or viable if you didn't address them? Um, and it's an art to try and, you know, present these in a way um, where you won't scare people, but it's, you know, really great to do this kind of critical thinking. Um, and when you can, you know, kind of prep people for that conversation to really dig into it, it can be really rewarding. Okay, so um, when we think about how um, the SWAT could serve you in um, collecting compelling content. Um, these are just some of the ways that I've seen that come through, right? Um, number one, of course, the more diverse perspectives you collect, the stronger the stories um, and, and hopefully those insights are. Um, I found that we've been able to collect things about um, how your organization does its work with um, people who are maybe secondhand to the service or a program that, that your first program participants, you know, are a part of. So what happens to the families and the neighbors um, of people who 
are involved in the, in the work that you do. Um, it's really incredible to see how like true acts of kindness um, are, you know, are in, are impacted, or I should say are present in your community. Um, and I know people often think of acts of kindness as just nice things, but sometimes they could be incredibly important things, you know, when, um, people deliver groceries, like in a snowstorm to somebody who's vulnerable. I mean, we've all heard of, um, how our neighbors and friends, um, and coworkers have reached out to each other, um, you know, over the past two years. And some of those things are really worth celebrating and can be really be a way for a community to come together when you find out about it. Um, so another thing that you might learn is about how the, things that you have said and shared as an organization um, or the leaders in your organization might have done, um, whether they be informal or the formal leaders of your organization. Um, there's a lot of work that they might be doing to influence decision makers that actually equate in real change um, for your causes. So sometimes when you can note some of that soft diplomacy that happens, um, that can really be um, a great way to show just how dedicated your team and your organization is to the cause. Uh, and then finally, um, I think this is a big, a great one is that in the kind of like the heat of the you know, media environment that we, that we're in, many of us are just overwhelmed. Many of our organizations are overwhelmed about what they should be talking about and what they should be commenting on. Um, when you find out what, what events in, um, communities are most, um, what they most care about, it can help guide your organization forward to create content, um, that people will click on and engage with and start conversations with you, um, and maybe even donations. So, um, it's, you know, these are the things that you can use to seed campaigns with in the future. All right. Um, I wanted to just graph out for you, um, the different folks about how you might want to organize those different people that you might want to interview on your SWAT. So, um, I organized it into putting one team around your program folks, um, one, um, one third around the support functions of the organization. So, you know, mainly we think of that as development communications. Um, I know in, you know, public facing or policy organizations, you, that, those two folks might be the program department. Um, but if, if there is a fine line with that, um, you know, th that is, that's, you know, a different way to organize it. Um, and then finally, of course, your finance, you know, the maintenance folks, the HR folks, those are all um, great people to involve. Um, and then finally, you know, and of course, having these interviews with people who are like the formal leadership of your organization, you definitely want to check in with, um, you know, with your, um, you know, the head of your team to find out if that's okay. Um, but, you know, interacting with folks um, on the governance side of things, um, whether you have a national board, you have various volunteer committees, um, and then of course your actual board of directors. Okay. Um, the third bucket, right, of, of the work that we do with a SWAT is understanding organizational health. And, um, if you do expand your SWAT into different parts of your organization, um, I wanted to show you some of the things that you could uncover um, that you could then integrate back into your actual work, right? Um, you could find out like a need to improve um, the quality of your internal communications, you know, um, board, staff, and volunteers. And um, as people who are in the, I think ideally are, you know, are mostly, the, who are listening to this are in the development and communications um, teams. And so um, know that you can't be responsible for all the internal communications that happen, but you know, thinking critically about um, if there are some things that would be a small lift for you that could then help improve the overall relationships to some of your supporters um, and, and donors, then that might be worth thinking about. Um, Another way that could be helpful is, you know, if you get some insight from your finance team about the seasonality of the, your um, expense needs. So finding out that like, 
you know, if there is a good time to do um, a campaign to help with the cash flow, um, that might be something that'd be really helpful for your team to know about. Um, we definitely want to keep the finance folks happy um, so everybody can get their work done. Um, and then finally, you know, you uncover some shared priorities and work plans. So hopefully you could actually become a little bit more efficient in the work that you do if there are things um, with that you can team up with with other parts of the organization. Um, and then finally, there are hopefully will be stronger ways um, for you to highlight the great stuff that's happening around the organization um, and hold that up for others. So, um, you know, and that just has like a multitude of benefits moving forward. Okay, so we're um, coming up on the end of like the formal part of, of the presentation, but just wanted to kind of recap for you some of the things that we did together. So um, number one, SWOTs are definitely strong analysis tools to help you gain a better understanding um, of what your organization is experiencing at a specific point in time. That approaching the analysis with an open mind can help you uncover strengths, opportunities and vulnerabilities in both your internal and external environments. And finally, that diversifying and expanding the group that you interview is going to give you richer data. I have just a few more. Um, some of the, the big things that doing this exercise is gonna help you with. Um, number one, I think, Deepening your dialogues with your colleagues is um, something that can't be really overstated um, in this time when we're all doing remote work and it feels hard to have meaningful interactions with po people remotely. Um, having a construct for how to really get into something that matters to you, um, something that folks that might uncover some sensitivities that you and others might have could be really valuable. Um, and I hope that this is a tool for you in that. Um, it hopefully, you know, as I mentioned before, it will advance your relationships with supporters. If there are folks, um, you know, like your top peer to peer fundraisers, um, the kind of captains and ambassadors of your cause. Um, and maybe some folks that feel really strongly about you, but don't always, um, you know, communicate that openly with you. You might be surprised um, just how many wonderful things you'll learn there um, and deepen your relationship with them. Um, hopefully, again, I hope it helps you refine priorities and make them more meaningful to your everyday work. Um, again, strengthening the quality of your um, communications overall and provide you a deeper understanding of the organizational health um, for your cause. So, um, and with that, um, we can move into questions and answers if anybody um, has anything that they um, want to bring forward or need help with. Okay, so I do have one question before Great. everybody jumps in with theirs. Do you have a suggested time for how often a nonprofit should be looking at a SWOT or reviewing and redoing their SWOT analysis? Yeah, um, well, you know, as I mentioned, it's always a great thing to do when you're you're about to undertake a big new thing, you know, so um, if it might be a new way, a new strategy of doing like a peer-to-peer -peer fundraiser. Um, maybe it's a new, a whole new program that you have to interact with and, you know, come up with a can with a strategy for um, a new community that you're trying to outreach. Uh, I do, I don't really see much point, I think, doing it more often um, on an organizational wide level, um, you know, more than annually. Um, but again, you know, there's so many different ways that you can really segment off the SWOT analysis. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's about how it's going to best, best serve you um, and, and thinking about how relevant when you do it one time, how much of that is going to be relevant both in time and content to this new strategic question you might be entertaining. Okay, we do have a couple more questions. Okay. What are your thoughts or recommendations on doing this as a group with your board? Oh gosh. Um, so I think 
you know, to do it, to do it with, you know, with others um, could actually be really like doing it as a team could be really powerful. Um, again, I think the biggest things to, you know, think about is how to do it in a responsible way. If you're going to be interviewing folks that, um, where time might be a constraint for them, or they might have some sensitivity concerns. Um, you know, again, thinking about what proximity means is important. Um, so yeah, I, I think if you just, you know, make sure you take the time to plan out how to conduct the SWOT, um, how you want to arrange um, getting, you know, balancing that need of taking in perspectives that are going to be new and valuable to you while also trying to make sure it's still a manageable project for you all um, to actually, you know, take on. Okay, and this we might have to include in our follow-up email, but we have a question. Hmm. If you could share some examples of a completed SWOT analysis. Oh, yeah. Um, so I wouldn't be able to do that with my direct work because I need to protect the anonymity of my clients. But I will say um, the Bridgespan group, um, you know, they're a very, very prominent um, social sector advisory, advisory um, group. They do strategic planning. They have some pretty helpful articles on SWOT analysis and I believe um, case studies too. Um, the Stanford Social Innovation Review would also be a, a good source, I think, for looking at how others might have used SWOT analyses. Great. Give it another minute for any other questions to come through. Really want to thank you for your time today, Jessica. That was an amazing presentation. Oh, and I hope everybody was able to walk away with some really key things to get their fundraising and their marketing analysis ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Well, any other questions are coming in. I'm just going to go through this slide right quick. So this is just a testimonial from one of our clients at Causevox. Kenny is saying the flexibility of the platform allows me to create campaigns that look and feel like it's part of my native website. This goes a long way for donor trust and conversion. And it's very true. So if you guys wanna take the next steps with Causevox, you have the opportunity to sign up for free or start a seven day trial with any of the paid plans. You can book a demo, read more fundraising best practices, more marketing best practices, and explore more tips from our team with more free webinars or take any of the fundraising courses. So I just wanna jump back in and see if we have any more questions. And I'm not seeing any. So I wanna thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jessica, for a great presentation. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure, everybody.